And now a message from our friends at Fetching Food. The 1970s and 80s had elbow, gravy train, perina, meow mix, and bell bottoms. You've changed your clothes, now change how you feed your pet. Like bell bottoms, kick the kibble and join us in the 21st century with the healthiest diet for dogs and cats. Feed naturally, feed raw, feed fetching foods. And kittens, and welcome to another fun filled and informative episode of the Groomer Next Door podcast. I'm your host, Chris Green, and this is volume three of Insect Based Diet. This week, we are going to be joined by two great guys up in Montreal, Quebec, Philippe Pouillet and Paul Chenuda. And they have a great company called Wilder and Harrier. And right now, predominantly all that they're doing is dog treats, but my Goodness, folks, they are cutting edge and blew my mind when I was able to talk to these guys. And I really encourage you guys to take a look because the garbage that's out there, whether it's training treats or it's regular treats, it's it's filled with crap unless we're making it ourselves. And that's where I'm so sick and tired of the conventional garbage that's out there. And when people are making organic and holistic products to just cloud out all of this garbage. It really does a justice for me and makes me happy because honestly, they are pioneers and we really are very fortunate that there are people who are making this difference. Well, let's jump into our fact of the week. Most female crickets don't sing. That cricket in your house that's endlessly chirping away, it's probably a male. Most female crickets lack those sound-making wing structures. There are exceptions. Some female mole crickets, relatives of true crickets, sing, and males of some cricket species never make a peep. Honestly, I find all of this to be unbelievably interesting, and I just love learning more. By that sound, Paul and Philippe are about to enter the podcast studio. So with that said, welcome, Paul and Philippe, to the Groomer Next Door podcast. Hi, this is your flight attendant. We're about to arrive at Montreal, Canada. Thank you for flying with us. All right, this week on our third installment of Insect-Based Diet, we are very fortunate. We are in Montreal, Quebec. And of course, it would be completely the worst thing I could do with not talking hockey in a moment, because that is one of my favorite things to do, but we are joined this week <laughs> with Philippe Poyer and Paul Shenuda, and they are with Wilder Harrier up in the great, great white north. Thank you guys for joining us. Pleasure. Thanks for having us. Good, thank you. Um, now, of course, Hockey has been always my passion. I know that it may sound like a cliche, but it really is. I've loved it. I grew up in Southern California, which is not a hockey capital. And I have to ask the simple question, what happened to the Canadians this year? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and it's not, unfortunately, it's not only on the hockey side, it's on the business side as well. They completely lost touch with the with their fans and uh, even through every hardship I was a diehard fan but I'm I got to say this year is uh, the toughest one uh, I don't know I think they're I think they're going to correct their course and uh, they make changes in the in the management but uh, yeah and on the ice it's promising like we have a lot of young players like uh, Galchenyuk, Sherback, uh, Jonathan Drouin I'm I'm so hopeful and I'm happy that we get a high pick at the uh, on the on the track that is true. I'm going to give you that. Now, you know, it's great, though. Winnipeg is actually in. Now, I know your rival Toronto is in. Who is it that you're rooting for in these playoffs? <laughs> uh, personally, yeah, there, there is a big um, big rivalry between Montreal and Toronto, but I am pretty excited to watch uh, Toronto play. Like, I love their team. I love uh, their, their youth. And... Um, uh, Winnipeg also has a great team, so I'll, I'll root for both. And uh, if it comes down to both of them playing against each other in the finals, then I'll probably go for Toronto. I have a couple of friends from 
from there. And yeah, I love the players. You know, is, isn't that almost against the rules? You can't say that if you're from Montreal. You're not allowed to do that, I thought. It's like touching the Stanley Cup. I wouldn't, say that, to a, yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't say that to a Toronto fan, but to you, uh, no problem. I'm honest. So who do you think actually goes? Now, we're airing in June, so a little bit, we're recording a little bit ahead of time. So what is your prediction? Because now we get to actually, once this release, we'll find out who actually is right. What is your prediction on who makes it to the final this year? Oh, interesting. Um, I'll go with, I'll go with Tampa, Nashville. Really? That is a, that is a good choice. I, I, I'm surprised you're not going Boston out of the East. Uh, I'm surprised you didn't actually pick Winnipeg actually going because they, they got that sleeper team. I hate Boston even more than I hate Toronto, so I can't go. <laughs> well, you know what? I, it, it's a hard team to watch. I, I'm not going to say it isn't. And it, one thing about watching hockey and, and putting up with it is Boston does get away with a lot, and I don't know how. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Especially against us, I find. Uh, you know what? That's true. I remember that dasher board that uh, one of the players got smashed into by Chara, and that, that yeah, should have been. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That, that, what was that, like four years ago? And we're still talking about it. Yeah, it's a while ago. And um, in the West, I have to go, to go with PK. That's, uh, that's the whole point. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's right. I forgot about that. All right. <laughs> I forgot. Okay. That's, that's where... That's where the Habs lost uh, part of their soul. Yeah, very sad. Yeah, very sad. It wasn't a good move. So you're not really happy with Shea? Well, I think hockey-wise it was a great transaction, but, uh, like, um, I'd say she's still getting to the spirit or soul-wise, very sad moment. You know, I, I would go with the agreement. I mean, I still feel bad about that that trade i didn't really agree with it but i think that he was a major major part of your team and it's just so so hard to believe well yeah you know i could do this all day long and and honestly i'm sure you could too but we're here for a great purpose which is to talk about insect base um but you know of course yeah i would have been i would have been lax if i didn't actually talk hockey especially with people who are passionate with it. That's, ah, can't help myself. So tell us yeah. the origin story behind your company. Sure. So my background is uh, business, and uh, I was working at an investment bank in uh, mergers and acquisitions, but my personal passion is food, and uh, I was reading tons on the challenges of the food system, really obsessed with especially the environmental impact of how we produce our food and uh, what we choose to produce as food, as well as food waste. And um, one of the options that really hit home and I felt uh, we could have a a short-term impact on was uh, the potential of insect protein to replace uh, most conventional meats. Um, As you've probably had uh, discussed on on this podcast before, but as sparked by the report by the United Nations in 2013. So I read that in 2014 and uh, immediately told my best friend Paul, um, and we we had the habit of uh, meeting for a drink every like few weeks to exchange ideas. And uh, this one came on the topic, and uh, we never looked back. We worked uh, about a year on the idea um, part time when we had our, our different jobs, and then uh, as soon as we had a product to launch, I developed the recipes with an animal nutritionist, had retailers that wanted in. Um, we decided to go full time on this in 2015. Wow! I, you know, 2015 seems like just yesterday, and yet it's three years ago. And yet, how can that be? <laughs> I keep seeing that problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we we're asking that every day. Yeah, like time flies. Time, time flies. It's incredible. My gosh! I mean, you know, I don't know if you go through the same thing. When I hear the 90s, I'm like, oh, that must have just been what 10 years ago. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, same here. Yeah. It's so weird. Just, uh, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Just to compliment on what Phil just said uh, about the, the origin of uh, Wilder Harrier. Um, so the reason why we, we went to pet food uh, instead of uh, other sectors was because we thought that we can have a quicker impact on the food system in terms of adoption. So people are, may, might not be ready to eat, it, to eat insects themselves, 
but their bets are totally ready. They don't have any cultural bias. And so uh, if they like the state and it's good for them, then they'll go for it. That was uh, the thinking behind it. And we also saw that uh, there was a lack of innovation and novelty in the pet food industry. There really has been. And, you know, what's interesting is that now it's been three years, and yet still, I mean, it still seems like, like we're talking about something that, that's years and years in the making that we're far away from, yet the science is there. It's sustainable. Yeah. It's reliable. And yet it's it's still, now I don't know about in Canada, but in the U.S., it's completely unheard of. Yeah, they're uh, they're getting much and much more press, um, and we're really seeing a shift. Like I'd say, over the past few weeks in 2018, um, we're seeing a very different um, adoption or excitement around the insect protein in Canada that we haven't seen uh, since we started it. So, for example, uh, Loblaws, which is a huge uh, grocery chain in Canada, um, probably the biggest, has launched a uh, uh, on their own brand, a cricket protein powder um, across across the country, and uh, the potential of, insect, of uh, edible insects is in the media more and more and more. And so we go to consumer shows, and instead of having like ninety uh, percent of feelings of surprise and like weirdness and stuff, and ten percent of people that have heard about the potential, it's it's, it's uh, exactly the opposite. So we get like people that come to our booth just because they see the word cricket and are super interested and want to taste our product yeah. and we have to stop them and tell them this is pet food. Well, actually they, they could eat our food because it's all human grade ingredients and, but it's, it's just like, <laughs> just, uh, yeah, there's no sugar, there's no salt. So to the human palate, it's not very uh, exciting. But anyway, so just to say that there seems to be a shift in the mindset of people very recently uh, in Canada, at least. And see, that's what I find really intriguing about all this. And that's where I think you guys are on the actual front lines, being able to do something that, you know, honestly is cutting edge. And yet nobody, nobody in, in, uh, I mean, I can just speak for the U.S., is really talking about it, which is really what has always been my biggest kind of curiosity. Like, wow, this is so strange that nobody's, Nobody's doing it, but you guys really are, seem to be, in a sense, clean. This is being a, a real major pet product. Not only is it pet food and, and pet treats, but it's become so massive in, in people's diets. I think that it's just amazing. Yeah, and it, it has to, and uh, I don't know why in Quebec, but there seems to be a big... Um a big burst of young companies like us working on that um, for humans as well. Like we're sharing offices with NAC, NAC bars, which are making protein bars made with cricket protein. And we have friends around us that are making uh, pasta, uh, like fresh pasta made with cricket protein powder. And uh, we got people in Toronto making um, pasta sauce with mealworm and with cricket protein. And uh, I'm probably forgetting a bunch of other products. But yeah, in Canada, there seems to be a, um, boom, and yeah, nice, nice little boom. So we're also like, even if we're, uh, not competing against each other, they're definitely contributing to marketing the, that protein and, uh, our consumers, um, are hearing about the, this protein source like everywhere around them. And then they get to the pet store and they see our products and, uh, they pick it up. Now, do you think that crickets are going to, actually take the place of a meat-based protein? you think that that's exactly where we're headed? Um, so, personally, I don't think that they're the only solution, and not even... Uh, I think I think there needs to be a lot of radical changes in our food system, and uh, insects, not only crickets, insects are one of the one of the solutions. It will be part of the solution that I'm convinced. It's just a diversification of our protein sources. And uh, as we've discussed before the podcast, there are thousands of different species of edible insects, and that alone just can contribute to varying our nutrient the nutrients that we get and the taste profiles that we get. There are some super exciting taste profiles in insects, like a, a different species of ants that taste like pepper and uh, or lemon or ginger and stuff like that. Um, so I think there, there'll be one of the solutions and plant based as well and, uh, different lab grown meats, I, I think are going to be huge as well. So we're keeping our eyes open 
for all of these uh, alternatives. And for Wilder Harrier, it's not the, the, the solution. Um, well, I mean, our, our purpose, our mission is not only insect-based, it's really just bringing more sustainability into the pet food system. And so we already have one line, for example, made with uh, seaweed protein, which we oh. think also is a great alternative. Seaweed protein, interesting. That is a, now that that's one that I have not heard yet. That is really cool. <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, wild harvested in Quebec, and so it's a zero input crop, no um, no fertilizer, but also no fresh water use and no CO two emissions. So it's a very uh, low impact protein source. Yeah, oh, and currently it's still uh, very underused uh, all around the world. Well, mostly in North America. Uh, in Asia, they use it a lot more, but it's, uh, it has a great potential. It can even invert the CO2 uh, composition of the atmosphere because it, it, it actually takes in. So it's a really, uh, really interesting protein as well. And like Phil was saying, I, I share the same belief that uh, it's a mix of different uh, proteins and not just proteins. Uh, uh, using um, food waste or, or revalorizing different ingredients is also a good way to have a minimal impact on the food system. So. For example, in one of our lines, the seaweed line, we also use some fruit pulp from a juice company in Montreal. So that's another way of um, diminishing our impact on the environment uh, by by just using perfectly good ingredients. A byproduct yeah, that, exactly. that would be thrown away. Yeah, good point. That is really cool. And that would actually go into the plant base with that because it's not an actual – it wouldn't be considered yeah, – you, you could say it's plant-based, uh, but uh, – it's more. It's it's not an alternative protein. Uh, an alternative protein. It's more just working in circular economy in general. Uh, instead of using new ingredients to try to valor, um, revalue byproducts of the system. For example, uh, we're exploring working with breweries to reuse the spent grain that's left after the brewing process. That is thrown away usually. So stuff like that. That is, you know, that's science. At its best, because we're actually taking something instead of processing garbage, we're actually taking real things and actually purposing them and, and sustaining. That is absolutely amazing, and that's something I haven't heard yet. So that's amazing. Thank you, thank you. We're trying to do something different uh, ahead of uh, the other players, uh, always. So that to hear that it's, uh, it's novel for you. Yeah, just bring novelty and uh, exciting stuff to the, the pet owners. And, and you know what? That's what really intrigues me with you guys is that you have. You've, you've kind of coined that as your own, which I do actually appreciate that. Being a pet parent first, I like to see that there's a sustainable company that's responsible instead of, well, we're just going to process and process and process and not really care. You're yeah. really putting a lot of thought into it, which is what matters. Yeah, and there are many ideas that are not out yet, so yeah. stay, stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go down a little bit on your product line. Now, one thing that caught my attention immediately is the fact that you're very conscientious for your vegan pet parents. A lot of vegan pet parents are concerned. They want their, their dogs and their cats to actually be on more of a plant base. But also we have to remember that there are a lot of dogs out there that have a great deal of allergies. So with your treats, mm -hmm. you've covered that. So you have pear spinach, pineapple ginger, and cantaloupe carrot. Boy, they all sound so good. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about those products. Yeah, so that line is actually the uh, seaweed protein line. So it's not only vegan, it's also using an alternative protein that has a very low environmental impact. And the seaweed that we use, wakame, is very, very nutritious. So it's a high source of uh, most vitamins, A, B, C, D, E, and K, um, and is also high in magnesium, calcium, and iron, so uh, with many health benefits. And uh, it's the, the, the recipe itself is pretty high in omega-3. Um, from the flaxseed, uh, a little bit from the seaweed, but also from the flaxseed that we add, um, with a great ratio with omega-6. So very good for, um, for joints and mobility, uh, for a healthy heart, for skin, for, and then the recipes that you mentioned are actually the recipes of the juices. Uh, so that's the line which, which we, which we partnered with a Montreal juice manufacturer, Loop. Um, and so we just 
use the pulp that's left after the processing of uh, each of their recipes. Uh, we we handpicked uh, three recipes that match with like dog nutrition uh, profiles. Like we, uh, they have a grape juice that obviously we we didn't uh, we're not using. And so um, yeah, that's it. And so using the pulp makes that line also very high in fiber, and so actually very good for uh, to promote uh, digestion. Wow. I mean, you covered every single base on that, didn't you? That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Getting used to, to talking about it, which is good. It's a healthy snack. It is a healthy snack. I mean, and, and if it's um, a belief system, I mean, I'm vegetarian. I, I can't cross over because I do like my milk a little bit more than I need to. But, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, so that's my only part that really stops me from being anything to vegan. But you yeah. mean for all of our vegan pet parents out there who really are conscientious, that really does the trick. I mean, I can't think of a product out there that has the levels of vitamins and protein that the, your vegan treats have. That commended big time for that one. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Let's go to something that is very important. At least it is to me. And that is training treats now you have soft cricket training treats you have your blueberry honey shiitake turmeric and pumpkin carrot which again every one of them sound absolutely delicious so let's go down those list i I know my dogs love every single ingredient that's in all of these so i was just like well you've already got my dog's attention (laughs) yeah we tried to to make some really interesting recipes that people uh already like and dogs already like, so pumpkin is a classic, as you said, blueberries. Uh, but apart from that, it's the, the main ingredient or the ingredient that's really interesting is the cricket. Mm-hmm. So in that, in that case, it's really high in protein, high in omega-3s. And one key feature of the product is the hypoallergenic aspect of it. So a lot of pet parents are looking for treats, for training treats, but they can find something that's hypoallergenic. And uh, the, the cricket, since it's not... Uh, used a lot in the pet food industry or perhaps not at all. There's no allergies to it for, from dogs normally, typically. So we actually have a lot of our clients going for that specific line because of that feature. And, uh, as well as some vets, uh, giving those treats as well. Uh, I would say about 40% or 50% of the clientele will choose this, uh, this line because of the hypoallergenic aspect to it. And then, like you said, all the ingredients are human grade. Uh, stuff we eat ourselves. I personally eat every batch of production to test it out. So <laughs> it's all clean ingredients. So now I've heard different takes on what it takes tastes like to actually have something made with cricket powder. Give us kind of your take on what you think it tastes like. Kind of define it to some kind of way that everybody actually would understand. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. There's obviously not a perfect way to describe it, but I, I would think there's definitely a bit of a nutty, nutty taste to it, so kind of an earthy, nutty taste to it. And then there's also a uh, similarity with um, with shrimps and crustaceans in general because they're the arthropod, arthropod family. Mm-hmm. So there's this kind of taste. Um, I would say, yeah, it's, it's very very unique as a taste. But depending on, also on how you mix it in with different ingredients, the different profiles of the taste will come out. Um, yeah, that, that's my thing. I don't know if Phil has something to add. Yeah, no, I think that's it. A, a nutty shrimp. Yeah, to be the taste profile. Now, I, I heard this in a rumor. I have not been able to actually verify this one yet. But I've heard that if you have an allergy like I do to shellfish, crickets are probably something you should not eat because it has a very similar, whether it's the high in protein or there's something to do with something to there to that extent that if you have an allergy to shellfish you shouldn't eat cricket or cricket powder is that true have you heard anything about that yeah well uh there is a risk of uh allergy to cricket if you are allergic to crustaceans uh yes to shellfish so we do write it on our packaging um shellfish allergies are not very common among dogs so we mostly write it for the for the dog owner but yeah so every cricket protein company that uh, that is out there uh, that I know of writes that uh, claim under packaging to make sure that people are aware of it. Dang. I never will be able to eat cricket powder. Anything with cricket powder in it. And honestly, and I say this seriously, not a joke, I actually was very interested to try something with cricket. 
So I'm like, oh, I can't do it. And when I heard it the last time, I was really surprised, and I, I wanted to verify that. So, huh, interesting. Hmm. Yeah, maybe they're, they're going to find a way to, to isolate the, the, the molecule so you can maybe try crickets in the future. But for right, right now, it would be safe not to try it. Indeed. You know, it's funny because... Of of my generation, I'm I'm in my 30s, and for our for my generation, it was very common to have shellfish allergies. And now, as as we've kind of metabolized in in years, now it's more like a peanut allergy and and things that we would never have been allergic to. So I think it's weird that that crickets would have the same. I, it's the only thing I can see is that it's high in protein, and I guess crustacean is high in protein as well, which causes well, this, this situation. There's actually a biological explanation that's, that's probably it, is the fact that it's just, they have a common ancestor or family line uh, in the family tree of biology, which is uh, arthropods. Ah. It's just that, it's a, I think it's a genetic thing that the insects and particularly crickets are, are biologically close to the shellfish, but I'm not an expert, but that's what I understood. That's interesting. So you've, you've already taught me something massive today, which I have to appreciate that just in that alone, but uh, I still feel a little bit bad. I don't get to have crickets. And, and I, you know, I, but when you, when you say it out loud, it sounds like I'm kidding, but I'm really serious. I really was kind of curious. I was only really skeptical because I heard there was an allergy. Yeah. Yeah. That's a bummer. And yeah, there's a lot of people who are right now really, really eager to try it out. So. Uh, I, I feel you. Yeah, <laughs> <Maybe> that's been good. <laughs> yeah. Oh well. Now, now the next line is your cricket biscuits. You have apple cranberry and banana peanut. Which again, I I just in a sense just hold the cricket and I'll take everything that you have because it all sounds delicious. Um. So let's go into that actual uh, product line and kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah, just to add something on the last line is uh, just the fact that soft training trees are generally uh, generally will use glycerin to uh, retain the moisture and make a softer product. And uh, glycerin can have a lot of um, um, negative n- yeah negative impacts on on digestion and on dog health. So we made sure we worked very hard to make a product without glycerin. So there's um, absolutely nothing added to the product, even the uh, the the way we preserve it is lemon juice. It's all very very natural. And oh, wow. the hypoallergenic aspect as well is not only from the alternative protein, but we make sure also not to include any other common allergen for dogs. So it's grain free, it's dairy free, it's soy free, it's egg free. Nice. Wow, you really have covered it, haven't you? You've made a point to to almost eliminate any opportunity for allergens to actually. That's true. That's true. Rear its heads. That is a good thing. Um, now, on the apple cranberry and banana peanut uh, cricket biscuits, yes. what are something specific in each of those um, ingredients that stand out that probably your soft cricket treats, your your training treats, and your vegan may not actually have if there is any? Yeah, so uh, for this line, it's pretty, very similar uh, profile to the soft training treats, but in an oven baked uh, biscuit form. Um, one key difference is that the cricket protein is the first ingredient, so it's uh, much higher in protein, and you get uh, even more of all the benefits of the cricket powder. So uh, the omega-3 is, again, very high, the vitamin B12, the iron, the calcium. And then, um, so these lines are also grain-free, um, and just all, all of the other stuff that I mentioned before, soy, berry, egg. And another thing that um, a lot of consumers really appreciate is that in our apple cranberry line, the cranberries are um, almost 20% of the recipe, so very high in cranberries, which are a great antioxidant mm-hmm. for dogs. So, um, uh, again, uh, to, to prevent cancer and, uh, and stuff like that. Which, you know, is probably the biggest problem that we're faced with. It's It's so hard to believe that we literally should be looking alternatively, like exactly like this in, in an insect base to take away the potentials of very processed garbage treats that are on the market. And you know, what's hard is that those are front and center. Any place you go, whether it's in the U S or yeah. in Canada, 
they're right there forefront where your products should be at the front and their products should be pushed in the back. No, we agree. <laughs> we agree <yeah. laughs> now, here's the part that always, always questions me is, are we going to actually launch a dog food line, a cat food line, or are we going to stay with just treats? Uh, so we have a couple ideas of other treats or different uh, like jerkies and stuff like that that, that we have in mind. Um, but the main project for us has always been the food. Yeah. And the reason why we started with treats was that uh, it's a much more easier buy for consumers to be introduced to a novel protein, uh, whereas a treat, I'm saying, uh, whereas the food is um, much harder for, for a consumer to, like, immediately do that leap and yeah. commit to uh, trying such a different and innovative product uh, for his dog. Um, so we started with treats kind of to introduce this protein and build awareness for, for it and for our brand and build a consumer base. And now I would say we're at the point where our consumers are asking for the food. They want the whole Wilder experience because they – they kind of engage with the purpose, with the mission, um, with the company. As you were saying, the more the responsibility factor and the transparency factor are huge, especially in our industry. And so they're demanding the food. So we're actually working on that right now. And hopefully we can get it out by the end of the year. And um, cats is also a great question. So probably the question that we hear the most uh, e- equal to or right after are you guys working on dog food, is do you have anything for cats? So we, we have a lot of cat owners that want in that protein. So we're not working on that right now, but it's definitely in the plan. Which I can imagine once you actually get that lined up, you are going to just explode even bigger than what you are. Because cats, cats do get looked down upon, and I really don't understand why. Um, mm. They don't get the same kind of respect that a dog does so i'm always always kind of saying <laughs> let's give the cat something too yeah, uh, yeah and, well, well in our in our in our from our point of view is that it's uh, also a harder uh, product to develop because cats seem to be a bit uh, trickier on taste and a bit mm-hmm. more picky so that's the reason and it's also uh yeah it takes more r&d but we, we, we gotta give some love to the cat as well so it's uh it's in the pipeline. It's uh, a lot of work. And nothing always happens overnight. It's the hard things in life always take a while to get to. And unfortunately, being that cats are so finicky and tricky, it can be a real challenge. <laughs> Definitely. So here's an interesting question that I don't have the answer to. And since you guys are so much more experienced in this, maybe you'll have an answer to it. Is there any specific diseases that crickets only crickets have and they suffer from or is it just kind of normal life yeah so uh in terms of, of you mean like the rearing of crickets in farms do they have any kind of diseases that they that they may suffer from because you know how you know dogs and cats they all have a series of diseases that they can you know pick up i've never known of I really haven't known anything about crickets, so I'm always curious. Is there anything that they specifically suffer from? Yeah, so it's a very good question. We get it uh, asked a lot, but it's actually a very safe protein. Um, There's not any diseases uh, for every production batch that our supplier in Ontario, Canada does. There's a lab test showing uh, that it's uh, very safe. There's there's actually some lab tests showing that there's a lower percentage of inclusion or than um, of, 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 uh, of, uh, of, let's say, E. coli or stuff like that than in beef or chicken, so it's extremely low. Um, so there's no, there's no specific uh, disease uh, for, for crickets. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not an insect uh, rearer, so I don't know about the specifics of, uh, of that, but there's a, it's a very safe protein. Which leads me to the, the big question here is, why haven't we been doing this sooner? Yeah, it's a very good question. I think there's it's a multiple uh, multiple response to that, but I think first off, it's a cultural thing. Uh, it's just for some reason, uh, insects uh, are very popular uh, in, in the east. Uh, so maybe about half percent of the uh, half of the planet is eating insects right now. Uh, so it's a culturally accepted 
protein, the same way uh, we used to not eat lobsters about a hundred years ago, and just suddenly someone <laughs> gave attention to that, and now it's a it's a luxury uh, protein. So I think it's there's a big part of the the problem, which is the, the cultural aspect to it, just uh, being stuck with uh, the way we think about the, about food. But I think uh, what's nice to see is that people are more and more eager to try food from all around all around the world and trying to open their their vision about what is food, what is not food. Uh, there's also the fact that uh, in the cultural uh, and popular belief, um, insects are seen sometimes as pests to farms to to uh, the agricultural system. So that's a reflex that some people might have. But when it's done in a farm a responsible way, it's actually very sustainable and it's very good to, for, for humans and for pets and for, for feed. So yeah, it's uh we don't have the answer to why people don't do it, but we think it's uh, probably a mix of those uh, those aspects. I, I just I commend you for, for seeing the science and just the sustainability and being able to put product together that are actually alternatives to the garbage that's really out there. I mean, for really since the dawn of pet food, we've all as pet parents have been subjected to the crap that we're told, this is what it is. And this is what you feed. And it's only kind of degraded itself as time has gone on. And it's became a profit over a, a care for our dogs and cats and you know, it's just exactly. it's just great to see that you guys are doing something to actually change that conversation. So, a very big appreciation from me. Thanks, man. And uh, I think we're we're not alone. But that's a good thing. And we're, we're we're seeing a change in the pet food space uh, slowly but surely. Yeah. And more and more clients and partners and retailers that are asking for real food, real food. So that's just. It's obvious to us, and uh, what's good is that yeah, for a lot of people, it's more and more obvious. So hopefully, and, uh, it's, it's going to change, but it's changing, so it's a good thing. That's what matters. And you know what's great about this particular change is that it's not something that's years before its time. It really is a plug-and-play type of science. It's right there. The You don't have to worry about supplementing. You don't have to worry about mixing different things to actually get the right proteins. It's all right there, and that's what makes it yeah. so unique. So I love that. That's right. Um, what What is it you can tell us to look forward to in the future? What are some things that you can share with us? Besides we speaker. Can? Yeah, because we, we've mentioned the jerky. we mentioned the possibility of food. Is there anything else that, that we can actually throw out there to kind of uh, tease the audience? Mm-hmm. That's a very good question. Um, we're definitely working with uh, other insects, so it's not just crickets. Um, there's some some insects that have a more of a different taste profile, so we can maybe say that without being specific. Mm-hmm. But we're working hard with that and uh, getting some different textures, some different taste profiles from from totally different uh, insects and crickets. That's one thing, um, and. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of plastic. Cool. I, I think, yeah, but I think the food is the most exciting thing that we're working on right now and that could have the largest impact and, uh, for the, for the dog and for the, for the, the, the food system. Awesome. That is just awesome. Just to see that it's, it's almost there. I mean, again, almost there. you're, yeah. yeah. You, you, you're already, you're already tapped into a protein and a source that is, proven so that's just amazing uh, what have we not covered that we really need to be able to throw out there just to kind of educate everybody including me on the subject very good question well first off uh, we didn't mention the fact that insects are perfectly safe for pretty much all pets so they will naturally eat insects when when they given the chance mm-hmm. uh, they will like it so the digestibility of insect protein is actually higher, according to many studies, uh, than with, with pets. Uh, compared to beef or chicken, it's actually, it's actually better, so easily digestible. And that's why we're seeing that a lot of the pet parents are going for a treat. So that's, that's really a, one big aspect. There's no fear to be trying crickets for your pet. It's perfectly safe. 
uh, it's perfectly good. Um, then the other thing is just that um, you should just try it. It's a, it's a small bag. You try it, and if it's a, it's a hit with your dog, you can uh, you can you can really replace uh, your current treat and have a positive impact on the, on the food system. I like it. Yeah. And I, you know, that's, that's the funny part. When we started this, it's, you know, you look at, at a, your personal house. Just think about it. If a bug does come in, grasshopper or whatever, even a cricket, what does your cat or dog do? They eat it. Same thing with a spider. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They want to eat it. It's natural. We're just, we're just helping them out, helping them out doing, to doing it. So yeah, it's very natural for them. It is completely natural. And, and you think about it when dogs were, you know, before we domesticated them and they were in the wild, what would they eat? If they couldn't actually hunt and they were starving, they would find a bug when they were licking a leaf to get some water. Maybe there was a bug there. They were able to ingest yeah. it. It's, it's all natural. Exactly. That's what makes it so yeah. cool. And all the right. same way that it was natural, that is, that is natural for humans. So we ate insects before we ate beef or other protein. So. We were eating insects and we were giving them to our pets thousands and thousands, thousands of years ago. So it's even natural on that side as well. And just a, just a small disclaimer, you shouldn't give your pets, uh, shouldn't give, let them eat any insects they see all the time because it's not in a farm the way. Uh, so, so you want to control the, the type of, uh, of protein that you give them. But it's, if it's a, it's a, if it's a wild area product, then it's perfectly safe. Exactly. That is a really good point. And you, you don't just want to let your dog just go out there and start eating stuff off the grass because, you know, obviously you don't know what your neighbors may have put a pesticide. Yeah. It might be in the, on right. that bug. So that is a good disclaimer. Absolutely amazing disclaimer. Thank you for throwing that in there. You know, yeah. it's something that we should say. Well, I really appreciate both of you being on and I definitely always say please come back tell us more what's going on this is not just one of those well we're only doing it for the series we don't want to talk about it afterwards no (laughs) you guys are always invited back and you know it's been appreciated for me to be able to learn a little bit and i love what you guys are doing i really appreciate it thank you chris it was a real pleasure talking to you it's been a pleasure well i'm chris green have a petastic week bye-bye everybody okay guys it's my bedtime